God for his grace and his mercy. Another rightly divine the word of truth Bible study. Amen. The Bible reads in Romans chapter 6, verse 1. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism into death. That like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. In newness of life. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall also we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. And so to be born again, uh, to be a saint, is to be uh, born of water and of the spirit. We have repented of our sins. We receive water baptism in the name of Jesus Christ, submerged in water for the remission of our sins receive the gift of the Holy Ghost with the audible witness of speaking in tongues and with the evidence of a sanctified lifestyle. Hence, we do not continue in sin. Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Do we dare think that the more sin we commit, then the more God's going to extend grace to us, the more grace uh, uh, we will experience, God forbid, how shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? And so if you are dead to sin, that means that you've been born again. And how in the world do you live in something that you say you've been freed from, mm -hmm. that you've been birthed out of or away from? And so we have been baptized into Christ. Uh, so the old man is crucified with his deeds. And so the things we used to do, we don't do those things anymore. Now, the importance of reading those few verses in Romans chapter 6 is for us to understand that saved folks don't behave like unsaved folks. Mm -hmm. Saved folks don't talk like unsaved folks. Saved folks don't walk like unsaved folks. We don't live the way we used to live. If you live the way you live before you profess to be saved, then you are not saved. If there is no change, there is no salvation. Because when you are saved, that means you are sanctified. And when you are sanctified, that means you have been set apart. And we're set apart for God's use. And God can only use a clean, holy vessel. A vessel that practices sin, God cannot use. Folks love to talk about, you know, in the Old Testament, God spoke through a donkey, right? In the Old Testament, nobody was filled with the gift of the Holy Ghost. Mm. But in this New Testament, in the church age, we have the Holy Ghost. So God doesn't need to speak through a donkey. Doesn't need to bark it through a dog. He speaks it through his holy vessels. Yeah. Uh, and so you have to be able to distinguish the voices which means that God does not speak through unclean vessels. Uh, but as we begin to look at our own lives, and sometimes you have to forget about everybody, or really all the time, but focus on forgetting about everybody else and really apply the word to your own personal life. And the question that is fair for all of us to ask for our own personal spiritual well-being is, is my behavior pleasing to God? Are my thoughts pleasing to God? Are my ways pleasing to God? I don't care what man thinks or man says. I don't care what you think, how you feel, what you say. The question is, what does the Bible say? And, and is what I'm doing consistent with what God requires through his written word? Not through dreams and, and, and visions and, and premonitions and all that stuff, but through his written word. Is God pleased with our living? And so tonight for a subject, I want to use practical living and behaviors of the saints. 
practical living and behaviors of the saints. Now, too often, I think, we get bogged down in too many specifics or particulars concerning salvation, and we miss the whole, the whole point of the change in our lives. You know, uh, uh, those of us who are of what folks would label as the more conservative or extremist uh, uh, apostolics, where we don't go, uh, we don't do worldly activities, we don't go worldly places, we don't, we don't, you know, don't do, don't wear, and so forth and so on. Uh, but you can, you can uh, uh, get too bogged down in the, the, those little picky things and miss the whole point of being saved. See, you can't dress holy, but then your attitude is unholy. Okay. Now, if you're holy, let's get this straight, because you know, folks say things like this. Well, even women with long dresses uh, pull them up or pull them down, whatever the case may be. They do. But a holy woman covers her flesh. A holy woman does not expose her body. A holy man does not expose his body. Okay. So even though there are some who say that they are holy. Uh, and they are, what, and I mean, again, I'm talking about man's labels right now, okay, what man considers as conservative, conservative or, you know, traditionally apostolic doctrine was a very Bible-based doctrine, and most have gotten away from it, but you can't get bogged down or, or be, deceive yourself into, into believing I'm holy only because I wear these clothes, don't go here, don't do this, don't say that, okay? It's a big picture of being holy. When you adopt the lifestyle of righteousness, it is what drives everything you do. And so you don't have to get bogged down in what I don't do, what I don't wear, what I don't say, where I don't go. You get bogged down in pleasing Jesus. And when you, when you become preoccupied with pleasing Jesus and all the other voices that could potentially be, dis, uh, 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 could, could, uh, be discouraging or maybe intimidating, when you become preoccupied with pleasing Jesus, you, you turn a deaf ear to doctrines that are ungodly. Okay, so we can't continue in sin because we've been born again. So looking at our lives, talking about practical living and behaviors of the saints. Now turn to the book of 2 Thessalonians, uh, chapter number 3. And that's pretty much where our text is going to come from tonight. Second. Uh, Thessalonians, uh, chapter number three. Let me turn there. Yes, G. Second Thessalonians, chapter number three. I'm gonna find it eventually. <laughs> first, first verse. Finally, brethren, uh -huh. pray for us that the word of the Lord may have free course and be glorified even as it is with you. Now, the, first, the first request here of Apostle Paul to, uh, to, the, to the Thessalonian church, to understand this was, a, this was a new church, and Paul had to leave them in a hurry. But he never, ever abandoned them. His heart was with them. His spirit was with them. And they were under attack because of damnable doctrine. And uh, there were letters written... Uh, by other folks who, who that were sent under the signature, the, the falsified signature of, of Apostle Paul, Paul and Rutherford letters. And what they were trying to convince the Thessalonians of was that the, re, the, the uh, rapture, the resurrection had already taken place, the second coming had already taken place, okay? Uh, which means that they missed it. Uh, then you had some, you know, folks were uh, leaving their jobs, stopped working becoming lazy uh, and and some were, were so they were so misled until they thought that they could just live and you know there was somebody to feed them and take care of them and and Paul makes it clear you know every man is to work if you don't work you don't eat um, and so there were a lot of issues confronting this church and Paul was addressing these issues but there's one thing that comes along with addressing error with, with addressing falsities, with, with addressing lies, is that there will always be opposition to truth. Now you have to you have to gird up the loins. We're gonna get there. Gird up the loins. Let me know what. That, in fact, says G, stay where you are, but just flip over to um, First Proverbs twenty three and three. We do want to go to First Corinthians chapter six, Proverbs twenty three and twenty three. By the truth and sell it not. Also wisdom and instruction and understanding. 
And so as people of God, we have to be committed to God's truth. And we ought to buy it and sell it not, which means don't compromise it. Stand on Bible truth. God says it, that settles it. Whether you believe it or not, God says it, that settles it. Our belief in God's truth does not alter God's truth in any way. Okay, God says it, that settles it. I'm going to go with what God says. Now, when you go to 1 Corinthians chapter 6, begin at verse number 1. There are any of you having a matter against another, go uh, to law before the I'm unjust. Sorry, I'm sorry, wrong, wrong, wrong scripture. First Peter chapter 1. First Peter chapter 1, verse 13. Right. Wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, and hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. All right, hold on. Wherefore, be Gird the loins of your mind, right? Yes. Okay. You have to find strength in what you're doing. Now, y'all going to have to work with me on this one because I left all of my, I left everything at home on my, on my disc. I didn't have it in my computer. So uh, I had to sit here doing the review and, and come up with a lesson. All right. But don't worry about that. That's why you got to study so you don't have to make it up. It's always in you. Amen. Thank and, but, you. But, that's why I write things down because you organize your thoughts, okay, in the scriptures. So now read first uh first Peter one and thirteen again. Wherefore, gird uh -huh. up the loins of your mind, uh -huh. be sober, uh -huh. and hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Keep going. As obedient children, not fashioning yourselves according to the form of lust in your ignorance. Uh -huh. But as he which hath called you is holy, uh -huh. so be holy in all manner of conversation, because it is written. Be holy, for I am holy. Was that 16? Yes. All right. So, gird up the loins of your mind. All right. The bottom line is be holy because God is holy. holy. Thank you, Jesus. Be holy because he is holy. holy. Not because Pastor Gandhi said be holy. That's right. But be holy because God is holy. holy. Be holy in all manner of conversation. Okay which means in all manner of living. Everything you do, everything you say, everywhere you go, everything you wear, every thought. Be holy in all manner of conversation. Every aspect of your existence, be holy. That's our charge. Now we have to learn how to commit ourselves to that. So uh, verse 13 again, wherefore? Wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind. Stop right there. Wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind because we have to be holy. But you have to gird, you have to have a, a steel will. S-T-E-E-L, will, W-I-L-L, -L, okay? A steel will where you will not compromise the holiness of God in all manner of conversation, in every aspect of your life, you must be dead set on pleasing God so now go back to 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, begin at verse number 1. Finally, brethren, uh -huh. pray for us uh -huh. that the word of the Lord may have free course and be glorified, even as it is with you. So as we embark upon doing God's will, uh, as Paul does here, he's requesting the prayers of the brethren. And so we have to pray for one another that we consistently and persistently do the will of God. Okay? Which, which means that we have to be less involved in criticizing things and be more involved in praying for one another. Okay, you can, get, you, can, you can become obsessed with criticizing everything people say and do and you miss the mark of Christ because now you become a judge and not a liver. Okay, be a liver of the word, L-I-V-E-R of the word and not a judge of the word. When you live the word, then someone who is in error has an example to watch, to follow, to learn from, okay? When you live the word, uh, uh, there's a difference. Uh, uh, turn the Corpus mic off, please. Off. Right here. Uh, so when you live it, and thank God, I, this, I should have done it earlier, check everything. Everything was unplugged when I left. Don't worry about it. It's been three weeks, thank God. But when you live it, when you live the word, then folks can see the examples. Did you get a corded microphone? It's not hard, y'all, come on. When you live the word, 
then folks can see an example. When you don't live the word, then folks can see an example. <laughs> and the example they see is of one not living the word. Therefore, there are inconsistencies in our testimony. You say one thing, but you live another. Again, practical living and behaviors of the saints. We are holy people. When you're holy, your lifestyle ought to be holy. There's no way you can be holy and have an unholy lifestyle. Amen? Amen. Finally, brethren, pray for us that the word of the Lord may have free course and be glorified even as it is with you. And that we may be delivered from unreasonable and wicked men. For all men have not faith. Now, there are those uh, who profess the being of the faith of God who lack faith. Faith in God. Now, one can lack faith in the holiness of God. Hence, they cannot live a lifestyle of holiness. Their conversation is not holy. Okay? They're living. Their lifestyle, their thoughts, their intentions, their ideas, their perspectives are not holy. And so uh, uh, we're warned that we may be delivered from uh, unreasonable and wicked men. For all men have not faith. Not all who say that they are saved are saved. We're saved by grace through faith. And when we are saved, we no longer live, live an unsaved lifestyle. So if you live an unsaved lifestyle, then you are not saved. Hence, you have not taken advantage of what faith does for you. Your faith in God will save you. But your faith in God is coupled with obedience. Obedience to the holiness of God. If there is no obedience to the holiness of God, then you lack faith in God. Because faith in God means you trust all that he instructs you to and to not do. All right? Okay, verse 3. For the Lord is faithful, who shall establish you and keep you from evil. Now, all men have not faith, but the Lord is faithful, who shall establish you and keep you from evil. Now, who keeps us from evil? The Lord does. Keep you from evil. Now, you can't get lost in where you don't go, what you don't wear, what you don't. He keeps you from evil keeps you from committing evil and keeps you from being a victim of evil. He keeps you from evil. So you don't have to practice evil, nor do you have to live a life where you're always a victim of evil. Even though evil will come against you, but no weapon formed against you shall. Okay. And so he will keep you from evil. We, and we know that all things work together for to them that love God, to them that are called according to his purpose. He will keep you from evil. Uh-huh. And we have confidence in the Lord touching you, that touching you that ye both do and will do the things which we command you. So, so Paul expresses confidence that once he teaches the people of God the ways of God, that the people of God will practice the ways of God. Now, here's the important thing is that one has to be taught the holiness of God. Not all are going to receive the teaching, but that's not my problem. My responsibility and yours is to stand on the holiness of God. If it is rejected, you could not become offended because it's God's holiness and not ours. We belong to him. So we do what he says. And if there, if there are brethren who don't want to obey the holiness of God, we don't fall out. We don't fall out, we don't get mad. We don't become uh, afraid of them, or we don't hate them, or anything like that. Because as long as one has breath in their body and the ability to think, they have a chance to be changed if they've not blasphemed against the Holy Ghost. 
They have a chance to be changed if God has not turned them into a reprobate mind. They have a chance to swerve from their evil ways. And so it is our responsibility to make sure that our living and our behaviors uh, are, uh, are holy. Uh, if not, then the example is not there. Talking, talking, talk is not going to do it. You've got, you got to live holy, not just talk holy. Okay? What verse are you, Pastor G? Verse 5. All right, read verse 5. And the Lord direct your hearts into the little God and into the patient waiting for Christ. Uh -huh. Now we command you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that ye withdraw yourselves from every brother that walk up disorderly, and not after the tradition which ye received of us. Now, there are brethren who don't want to please God for whatever reason, and you can't do anything about that, but you can't walk with them. How can two walk together except they be agreed? So you can't walk with them because they are walking in darkness and light hath no fellowship with darkness. darkness. So the, withdraw yourselves from every brother that walketh disorderly. There are those who say that they are saved and they cuss. They can't be your friend. You can't hang out with them. There are those who say they're saved and they dress any old kind of way. And wear any old kind of thing, and do any old kind of thing, and go anywhere that their their flesh leads them to go. Well, then, if you hang out with them, folks are going to associate you with them. Amen. And remember, evil communication corrupt Amen. good manners. And so, your communicating with evil will corrupt everything godly that you're supposed to be doing. You don't ever want to be identified or misidentified as one who is evil, um, all because you're hanging around folks who are evil. But but I, I guess the larger issue is is that if I'm committed to righteousness and my brother is clearly committed to unrighteousness, then why would the righteousness, the God and me, want to be with the the, the devil and him? It seems to me that clean wants to remain clean. So if clean is gravitating to filth, then clean has abandoned clean because it desires to be dirty, right? And then Jesus, in the words of Jesus, if man thinketh, if man looks on a, on a woman to lust, he's already committed adultery in his heart. So if, well, I don't know, well, but you desire to do it. See, this is why people change who say they're saved. You, uh, uh, we had the sanctified, the apostolic church, uh, where we had a doctrine in the apostolic church where women didn't wear pants, women didn't wear shorts, women didn't show their flesh, women covered their flesh, women dressed their mobs, and, and, and men too, okay? Uh, because the ether of women, we, we miss men, but there are a lot of men who are, who are just out of God's will. So where we dressed appropriately, where we were modest in our dress, uh, where we made sure that we put on a tire that was not going to be uh, tempting to anyone else. Uh, there was a time in the apostolic church where we testified, we don't go to the movies, we don't go to the ball game, we don't go to the uh, theater, we don't go to the bowling out, to the skate rink and all. And, and all of these things were because not because these things are evil of themselves, but because we don't we limit our our exposure to the ungodly. Because evil communicates to corrupt good manners. So those who are holy want to be around those that are sanctified because that is where our inheritance is located. Right? Amen. Okay. So that's how that was our teaching. Uh and there were uh, most apostolics taught women, as the Bible says, it's a shame for a woman to pray or prophesy with her head uncovered, and a, sh and a shame for a man to pray or prophesy with the head covered. And so we used to live by the word of God. And all this is in the, in the Bible. But then uh, our, many of our forefathers who taught this and stood on it and insisted upon it uh, passed away. And when they passed away, most that I know of from the apostolic church have changed. Most have changed. Okay. Well, if you go back to uh, 2 Thessalonians chapter 5, uh, verse number 6. 
And we command you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you withdraw yourselves from every brother that walketh disorderly and not after tradition which you received of us. And so all those who swerved in the writings of the great man of God, Apostle Paul, he gives us the wisdom to not fool with them, to withdraw ourselves. Understand? So now, verse number five, and Lord, direct your hearts. Uh, no, I'm sorry, verse number four. And, and we have confidence in the Lord touching you that ye both do and will do the things which we command you. And the Lord direct your hearts into the love of God and into a patient waiting for Christ. Now, now we command you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now we command you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. This is not a suggestion. Now we command that you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that ye withdraw yourselves from every brother that walketh disorderly and not after the tradition which ye received of us. Whatever the, the tradition from God was, and the tradition that we received from Paul came from God. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and it's profitable for it. All right, so God sent, Paul wrote what God told him to write. And so those brethren, quote unquote brethren, who wanted to change the standard given to the people by uh, Paul, by, by God through Paul, uh, Paul is commanding, he's commanding, it's not a suggestion, now we command you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that ye withdraw yourselves from every brother that walketh disorderly and not add the, tra the tradition which he received of us. So all those now who have anointed our, and I use anointed in a very uh, awful way, have anointed our forefathers who walked in the ways of holiness as outdated, ignorant, unnecessary, uh, uh, so forth and so on. Uh, we are commanded to withdraw ourselves from them. For yourselves know how you ought to follow us. For we behave not ourselves disorderly among you. And so the, the example given by Apostle Paul in this document in the scriptures and and the men of God who who wrote this Bible, who, who were the apostles appointed by Jesus, some after <coughs> Jesus uh, ascended and, and those who came out of due time, including Apostle Paul, they were always of the people, with the people. Uh, Paul in his writings makes it clear that though uh, he could lord over the people, but because he would love the people, care more about the people than, than he did himself, he made sure that he stayed on the level of the people. So he wasn't, he was not unwilling to use his hands to make a living. He was a tent maker. And when he got with Priscilla and Aquila, they were tent makers and they engaged in tent making and he made a living through tent making. Okay, it helped to subsidize his living. Uh, he didn't. He did not put a burden on the people through through intimidation, but he did. He did compel them through through godly, a godly heart to take care of the man of God. And it wasn't just him; it's any man of God. When you have God, when God calls a man to do his work, the best thing the church can do is support that man in the work, take care of him, so that he can be fully engaged in what God gives him to do, and that is to take care of spiritual things. But he never ever, ever strong-armed the people. Now, practical living and behaviors of the saints. The, the, the example, the conversation, first begins with the preacher. It is the responsibility of the preacher to exhibit a lifestyle of holiness that is consistent with the word of God, hence pleasing to God, and proves to be spiritually capital S, spiritually beneficial to the people of God. So anyone who has a mind to please God ought to be able to look at the pastor, to look at the preachers, and see Jesus. 
not because you say you're great, but because your lifestyle is consistent with the holiness of God written here in what we call the Bible. If your lifestyle is inconsistent with the holiness of the Bible, then you are not a Christian. Because a Christian is one who is like Christ. And so if my lifestyle is, is unlike Christ, then I am not a Christian. Now that a lifestyle, a doctrine, a standard that is not consistent with Christ, it opposes Christ. Hence, it is anti-Christ. And so we have examples of the spirit of anti-Christ in the church, where folks want to dress the way they want. They want to go where their flesh uh, 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 desires or lusts to go and do and say, and so forth and so on. Everything that contradicts the holiness of God, that is the spirit of anti-Christ. But we have to make sure that we demonstrate through our living uh, practical uh, behaviors that are consistent with the identities of the saints written here in the Holy Scriptures. Okay, uh, verse number seven again, this is G. For yourselves know how ye ought to follow us, for we behave not ourselves disorderly among you. Go ahead. Neither did we eat any man's bread for naught, but wrought with labor and travail night and day, that we might might not be chargeable to any of you. Okay, so now they weren't for sale. Uh, they didn't. Paul didn't have to stop preaching the truth because they would have held the money from him. You know, well, we did. God said, "Here, here's here's a an antichrist line in today's church. Well, you can't preach to, preach it too hard because the bills have to be paid." And if nobody's in the church, there ain't no bills going to be paid because they don't get no offerings, all right? So, hence, let down the standard of holiness to cram bodies into the church to, to, to uh, uh, raise larger offerings so we can do more things. Now, what that, what that translates into is then the preacher leaving his job, saying he's full-time ministry, but stays gallivants all day, does whatever he wants. He does nothing for God. Won't even sit down and study the word. Uh, the excuse now is that I don't have to because now we've got a lot of bodies in the church. So what does he do? Is he continues to compromise the holiness of God. Why? Because he's trying to get money and not trying to win souls. So we have to be careful. So here we have the great apostle Paul. Now let's make this clear. All right. These prophets and apostles in this Bible they made it. No question. Apostle Paul made it. He made it. The gospel, the, 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 the Bible authors made it. All the apostles except for Judas made it. They all made it. So, so here, here their futures, their eternities already established through the word. We're all trying to get there. I'd be a big fool to try to change the holiness given us by God through these men of God to try to accommodate what I think, how I feel, my perspective, my wisdom. And now I become so deep until I'm drowning in my own wisdom, which is nothing but foolishness. And not only do I destroy myself, but I, in the process, I destroy others. So that is the spirit of anti-Christ. Anything that is not with Christ is against Christ. It is anti-Christ. We verse 8 against the gene. Neither did we eat any man's bread for naught, but wrought with labor and travail night and day, that we might not be chargeable to any of you. We went to work, so no one would own us. Not going to sit back and say he came by and took all of our money. And did, no, no, no. We worked with our hands. And he had a right. He had a right to be taken care of by the people because he was working. He was laying out his life for the people to bring them to Christ. But he walked in the spirit, not in the flesh. So his focus was not on uh, uh, being a bully, a spiritual bully. His, his focus was not on extorting money from people. Paul's focus, as any real man of God's focus is, is to the winning of souls. And whatever that entails, that's what I'll do. But I will not be tempted to compromise truth 
for fear of somebody keeping their money, not putting it off or not paying their tithes, whatever the case may be. Verse number nine. Not because we have not power, but to make ourselves an example unto you to follow us. Uh -huh. For even we were with you, this we command you, that if any, sh if any would not work, neither should he eat. For even when we were with you, even when we were with you, this we commanded you, that if any man would not work, neither should he eat. And so today we've got preachers, they're full time, and, and all they call themselves evangelists, and all they do is go everywhere trying to get a date to go preach so they can get an offering. So uh, they'll call you to Dallas to come run a revival. And you stay in the hotel all day chilling, go to the pool and all that kind of stuff. They go to a service for two or three hours in the evening, uh, do some running and jumping and howling and singing and so on and so on, and go on back and get paid handsomely. Okay? That is not God. That is not ministry. That's not, that's not, what, that's a hireling. Because if they were truly doing the work of God, than doing their day. Now, now you're going to see, here's a problem with what we do. Most of what we do is our own ministry and it's not God's ministry, okay? If you take Bible examples, when Philip was preaching to the eunuch, after Philip got through doing with the eunuch, what God had him to do with the eunuch, we was, what happened to Philip? He was caught up. He was gone. He had someone else to go to do more work, all right? Paul, and Silas, Paul and Barnabas, when they would go on their missionary journeys, God would, would instruct them where to go and what to do, who to go with. Even when he had some personal spats and so forth, uh, they worked their differences out, and they may have parted, but they still were doing the work of God. All right? Today, not so much. I look at uh, 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 preachers, and yeah, I'm talking about young, young preachers, y'all who sit around all day. They'll have a wife who goes to work and kills herself all day. They sit at home full, fully functional, healthy young men. All they're, trying, all they're trying to do is get a job on full-time ministry. They don't, they don't have enough respect to, for learning God's word to go to school mm. and get a degree. You're full-time. <laughs> full-time ministry, not working. Get up, get up in the morning, put your, put your clothes on, clean yourself up, and go, go to school, learn something. They sit around and learn nothing. That's why when they get up and preach, they deceive so many because they, they learn all the church antics and behaviors, but they don't learn anything about the word of God. I follow me? And so people are being destroyed. So what these things do is that they adversely affect practical uh, living and behaviors of the saints because the people in the church are mistaught holiness. So that their, their example is, oh, he preached up a storm. And after the service, we went out to eat and he cut a fool. Y'all understand? And he hit on the sisters or maybe the brothers, whatever the case may be. So all these things now, we have to be careful because they'll try to misidentify us as them. But you can't, if you hang around them, the folks are going to identify you with them. And you do not want to be identified as one of them. So you have to be careful who you hang around with. Not because we have not power, but to make ourselves an example unto you to follow us. Verse 10. For even, with we, for even when we were with you, this we commanded you, that if any would not work, neither should he eat. Amen. For we hear that there are some which walk among you disorderly, working not at all, but are busybodies. All right, so some folks just don't want to work. Say to say. Now again, the example begins with the pastor, with the with the preacher, with the man of God. It doesn't begin with the peoples. And we have a lot of pulpits who insist that the people are gonna do what I say, you're gonna bring your money, so forth and so on, and and and, and will will begin to manipulate situations and people and things and, and, and intimidate and deceive because they're trying to get more money. Now, this is ungodly, but this, is, this affects the, 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 the overall or the, the larger picture concerning practical living and behaviors of the saints. Because, again, we don't, we don't get bogged down in <clears throat> every little uh, detail uh, and trying to identify ourselves holy because our dress is holy. We have to be holy in all manner of conversation. But if your foundation is holy, 
is not holy, then that that is built on that foundation will not be holy. Mm -hmm. The way for you to grow in holiness is to be founded in holiness. No holy foundation, no holy growth. Mm -hmm. No godly foundation, no godly growth. And so we have to become uh, uh, obsessed with being like Christ in all manner of conversation, in all manner of living, our behaviors, our thoughts, our intentions, our motives, our ideas, our ideals, our philosophies, our theologies have to be holy, must be godly. And if they are not consistent with the word of God, then they are not holy, they are not godly. God would never give me a thought that contradicts his word. God will never give me a thought, nor you, that contradicts his word. He will never call me to an office that contradicts his word. Never. He will never, he will never authorize or empower me to do. Or he will never call me to do anything that contradicts his word. All right? Uh, uh, what verse are you at? 13. Come on now. But ye, brethren, uh, yeah. be not weary in well-doing. Uh, yeah, let me stop right there for a second. Be not weary in well-doing. See, you start looking at, because listen, the way, the way that leads to destruction is wide, and the, and the, uh, uh, the, the, the gate is wide, and the way is broad. But the way that leads to righteousness, the gate is narrow and the way is straight. So the straight and narrow way, there are going to be very few travelers. The broad way, the broad crooked way, the wide way, many going to be going there. So you cannot be ye, but ye brethren, be not weary in well doing. So there will not be very many who are going to be committed to well doing. Be not weary in well doing. Jesus healed, healed 10 lepers. Only one out of the 10 came back to thank him. But don't you be weary in well doing. Which means that you cannot be <clears throat> so caught up in excuse me, so caught up in the things that other folks are doing, where now you get bogged down in trying to fight them instead of pleasing God. So you come to church and be so caught up in trying to determine who's right, who's wrong, so you never hear from Jesus. Look at her, look at him, look at them. But what about looking at yourself first and being that example? So when you are the holy example, then you're not, you're not going to persuade them through criticizing them all the time. Let the preacher handle that when God says to handle it. But you live the holy, sanctified lifestyle. You behave in such a way that is consistent with the holiness of God. Then Jesus in you shows himself. Because it's in you. Now, he cannot show himself if he's not in you. Uh, so, but ye, brethren, be not weary in well-doing. So if you're doing the will of God, be not weary. If, you're, if you are obsessed with holiness, holy walk, holy talk, uh, where you go is holy, that everything about you, you just want it to be holy, 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 don't be weary. When you criticize, can't be weary. When you're opposed, you can't be weary. You can't get upset when folks criticize uh, uh, the way you dress. You can't get mad. In fact, you shouldn't even be entertaining that. Let that stuff go. It does not matter. And all right, 14. And if any man obey not our word by this epistle, note that man and have no company with him, that he may be ashamed. Now, leave him alone. Know him and have no company with him. Leave him alone. If they don't obey the holiness of God written in his word, leave them alone. Uh huh. Yet count him not as an enemy, but admonish him as a brother. Now don't count him as an enemy now. You can't hate him, okay? Because you still have to be concerned about his soul. Amen. So you warn him, but you can't fool him. And if he continues to reject the word of God, remember that's not rejecting you, not rejecting me, he's rejecting God. But if you reject my Jesus, we can't be friends. Because I'm stuck on him. And if you're not his friend, then you're not my friend. Read on. 
Now the Lord of peace himself give you peace always by all means. The Lord be with you all. The salutation of Paul with mine own hand, which is the token in every epistle, epistle, so I write. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. So now Paul simply closes out, closes out with, with tremendous warmth, okay? With the, with, the, with the reassurance that Paul is writing this himself to them, okay? Do what the man of God says. Now, when there is the holistic approach to holiness, we don't look to pick and choose the things that we want to be consistent uh, in terms of the word. You know, it's amazing how our forefathers got it wrong when it came to dress codes, when it came to socializing, all these kinds of things, language. But I've never heard any of those preachers say they got it wrong when it came to tithing. Yeah. They never said they were wrong when it came. In fact, they, they, today, the preachers require more. Yeah. Yeah, they, want, they want more than that. Tip. They want more. Some have a doctrine now where if you're late, you've got to pay 15%. I mean, there are all kinds of doctrines out there. Yeah. Yeah, interest. Yeah. All kinds of doctrines out there that are dangerous. So you have to know what the word says. Now, you cannot uh, 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 demonstrate practical living and behaviors that are consistent with the Word of God if you don't know the Word of God. So it is important that we know the Word of God. We don't walk in Christ based on morals. We walk in Christ based and founded in holiness. Our obsession is in pleasing God, not in, not in impressing men. So when you say you're saved and you're trying to stand out from other folks, then you're trying to impress men. So your commitment is not to Christ. Your commitment is to impressing men. Some of us say we're so saved. Oh, we, you know, we, we, we don't go, don't do all these things. But, but, but it's, we have bragging points. It's not godly. Because we're not trying to be more saved than anyone else. We're trying to be consistent with the holiness of God that is written in his holy word. It has nothing to do with trying to out-hold it, out it, out-sanctify somebody else. But it's about pleasing Jesus through his written word. If we're not pleasing him, then we are not in order. Now, today's church has taken on a very disturbing flavor uh, where we have become bullies and intimidators and, and we become the, uh, the church Gestapo, the church mafia, uh, and all kinds of all kinds of uh, intimidating uh, or, or uh, uh, intimidating actions and behaviors are occurring in the church. When we turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 6, it seems like the so-called people of God have forgotten how to get along. If I'm saved and you're saved, oh, not we get along. If we have the same spirit, how are we not getting along? When 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 Paul and, and, and was it Paul and Barnabas who fell out? Uh, yeah, when they fell out, they didn't stay mad at each other, and they came back together. Ultimately, they didn't. They weren't huffing and puffing. You know, no, I hate you and all this stuff. I'm gonna go sue you. Blah blah blah. None of this stuff. But today's church is so out of order. Now, 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 listen. If the church takes the church to the secular world, then the church is out of order. And the one that takes the church to the secular world for quote unquote justice uh, is it's the preachers who go and file these lawsuits. They're the ones who, who do these things. So let's see what the Bible says about practical living and behaviors of the saints. And some of the, these things ought not be named amongst us. So, so 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse number 1. Dare any of you, having a matter against another, go to law before the unjust and not before the saints? Do ye not know that those that the saints shall judge the world? And if the world shall be judged by you, are ye unworthy to judge the smallest matters? Now stop now. So in today's church, well, we have a lot of, of church folks, organizations, and bishops and apostles. And all they do is sue other folks. Church folks. If, if a church is in an organization and the church wants to pull out, it ought to be their prerogative to pull out. 
And if the brethren can't sit down and come to a mutual understanding, somebody has to be sanctified and take the low road. Everybody's trying to strong arm today. Now, we're talking practical living and behaviors of the saints. This is consistent with the word of God. So, let me tell you this that when the church sues the church, then they are out of God's will, and they land themselves no more, they branded themselves no more the church. Because you, you have walked out of the will of God. You are now a transgressor. And some have become workers of iniquity because they involve other folks in their mess, in their sinful activities. There are any of you having a matter against another go to law before the unjust and not before the saints. So, you know, Paul understands we're going to have differences, but it's not, the, the, the problem is not in having differences. The problem is in how we satisfy our differences. Do you not know that the saints shall judge the world? And if the world shall be judged by you, are ye unworthy to judge the smallest matters? How in the world are we going to judge the world? We can't judge between small things in our That's lives. Amen. This is not godliness. Uh, they, I know they got robes on and stripes on them and they got big titles and all that kind of stuff, but they are ungodly. Verse 3. Know ye not that, that we shall judge angels? How much more things that pertain to this life? So what do what, 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 what we waste time on? Well, we, we want to, we don't, that's ours. Wait, wait a minute, hold on. Are we reading the same Bible? Now, here's what, here's what gets me. Many preachers will tell you, if you don't pay the tithe, you're going to hell. You're cursed, right? But they don't have, they don't have any Bible to support that. That's their opinion. The Bible will tell you something very different. You're not, you're not cursed if you don't pay tithes. You're cursed if you don't have faith in God. That's what, you, and he doesn't curse you, curse yourself. Because you, you lose access to his blessings because you lack faith. Without faith, it's impossible to please him. So faith in him compels you to want to give him not 10%, but 100%. Yes. Not just 10. 10 is not even a tip. <laughs> you understand? Just to, you want to get more. Because now you have faith in him and all you can do for him pleases you. But when I tell you, and well, now you curse and all this kind of way, first of all, it's not God's will for me to curse you. <laughs> but stars. But I have no Bible for those things. But, but, but the, the church will tell you, you, you curse, you're going to hell because you didn't pay tithes. But here the Bible says, there are any of you having a matter against another go to law, uh, to law before the unjust and not before the saints. And we ignore that. Now, this, this is very specific. But they will, they, will, they will defy this. But they go to things that Bible that they can't support in the Word of God, and they'll make those things doctrine. Uh huh. What what I speak? Well, go ahead. Verse number one. Verse verse four. Go ahead. If then ye have judgments of things pertaining to this life, set them to judge who are least esteemed in the church. Now here's our problem. It's called pride. We are too proud to step aside and let someone else make a decision. Those which are least esteemed in the church, why? Because they don't, they're they not going to lose anything. They're not looking out for their own personal interest. Because, you know, in, in talking about today's church, in today's church, the preacher controls everything. All right, he's the, he's the chairman, if you will. Um, and there are differences in bodies and so on and so on. But, but generally speaking, it's the preacher who makes the decisions. And so when someone steps in and says, hey, that's our church, and one preacher and the other preacher says, that's our church, and there's two preachers going to war, then they drag the people into the war with them. Okay? So the instruction Paul is giving here makes all the sense in the world. Let those who are least esteemed among you. And it does not mean they have to be a member of your church. They're members of the body of Christ. Go find those who are least esteemed. They're members of the body of Christ and let them decide. So verse number four again. If then ye have judgments of things pertaining to this life, set them to judge who are least esteemed in the church. Uh -huh. I speak to your shame. Is it so that there is not a wise man among you? Lord have mercy. No, not one that shall be able to judge between his brethren. 
but brother goeth to law with brother, and that before the unbelievers. Now therefore, there is utterly a fault among you, because ye go to law one with another. Why do ye not rather take wrong? Why do ye not rather suffer yourselves to be defrauded? Nay, ye do wrong, and defraud, and that your brethren. So here you are, defrauding your brethren because you go to law, the unjust. With brethren, we ought to be able to come together and let those who are least esteemed take the matter and make the decision. And we live by it. Okay. Isn't it great when we can drop our pride? We can stop being bullies in the church and start demonstrating humility instead of trying to be tough. So here I have, I'm say I'm a saint, and I go get a an unjust attorney who takes the just before the unjust judge to make a decision between the just. That's anti-Christ. That is the spirit of anti-Christ in the church. And so it, 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 our holy living and behaviors begin with a commitment to pleasing God. Our minds have changed. Romans 12 and 1, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living, a living, a living, a living sap, which means that living for Christ, you shall suffer things in the flesh. That you present your bodies a living sacrifice. I sacrifice this because I don't want there to be a rift between my brother and me. A living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. To, and be not conformed to this world and be transformed by the renewing of your mind that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God not your own will not to get your way not to prove yourself right but it's all about God if your heart is not turned to God then you cannot please him your priorities have to be found in Christ so in all that you do in your life, everything, everything you hold dear, those are your treasures. And where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. So if your treasure isn't always having the best stuff, that's where your heart is. So you'll do anything necessary for you to have the best stuff. If your treasure is for you to be the most loyal person in the world to the holiness of God, that that's where your heart is. And so you're preoccupied with pleasing God. Hence, your living, your behaviors will be consistent with the written word of God, and men will see Christ in you, who is the hope of glory. And by this shall all men know that you are my disciples by you having love one for another. That's how the world knows that we are of Christ because we don't mess with each other. We don't abuse each other. When we don't see it eye to eye, we don't fall out because we're saved. Understand? I love my brother enough to shut my mouth. Most things I disagree with, I don't say anything about because it's not for me straight now. It's for God straight now. If it contradicts the word of God, you know, it's okay. We're not going to pick a fight. My job is to present the righteousness of God and allow Jesus to speak through me and not me run my mouth of my own flesh because I'm going to prove you you're wrong. I'm saved. My job is not to prove to anyone that they're wrong. My job is to prove to everyone that Jesus is right. See, you get bogged down in, in disproving people. I'm going to show you where you're erring. Okay, but you've lost. Why can't I show you just the truth of Jesus? Watch my living. I know you say it's okay to do, go, wear, all that kind of stuff, but when you, when you observe the respect 
that the world has for those who are truly holy versus those who talk holy, but their dress, their uh, language, their lifestyle, all of that is inconsistent with, holy, inconsistent with holiness. You will see when folks get in trouble, they come looking for someone who's holy. There's a difference in the respect, but we don't, we don't, we don't uh, 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 walk around preoccupied with that. Our preoccupation has to be with simply representing Christ, and let our living be consistent with the Word of God, that the world may see Christ in us. So again, practical living and behaviors of the saints. It is written in the Word of God. All we have to do is be committed. To pleasing God. And if we're committed to pleasing God, we will win souls to Christ. But if we're trying to impress people, then we're not, our living is in vain. Because we're not living for Christ. We're living to impress folks. We're living to show them up. We're trying to show them that we're more saved than they are. You have already miscarried Christ. Already. For God so loved the world that he gave, he gave, he gave. We are to give. He gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have. Our desire ought to be for all men to come to repentance that they may take advantage of what God has already given us, everlasting life. All right. Thank God uh, for tonight's lesson. Amen. Thank God. Thank you, Jesus.